Welcome to the International Rett Syndrome Foundation Rett Ed webinar series. I'm Melissa Kennedy. I have the privilege of serving as CEO of the foundation, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Dominique Pouchard, Chief Science Officer of IRSF, and Dr. Kathy Bishop, Senior Vice President, Chief Science Officer, and Head of Rare Disease at Acadia Pharmaceuticals. We have a great discussion planned for today. IRSF recently conducted a webinar about the FDA regulatory process for drug approvals, and we've received a lot of terrific feedback on that webinar. That webinar provides a really nice context for our conversation today. If you've not seen it, I'd encourage you to take a look. You can find it as well as many of our resources on our YouTube channel. We're at a really exciting phase of drug development for Rett syndrome. Red is a very complicated disease, and we know that it's going to take a lot of different types of therapies and drugs, likely working in combination to meaningfully improve the lives of all individuals living with Rett syndrome. Today's discussion is intended to answer many questions that we've been receiving regarding Acadia's recent announcement that the FDA has accepted its new drug application for trifinitide for the treatment of Rett syndrome. This is particularly exciting for IRSF. Our foundation uh, supported the very early clinical trials for trifenotide, advancing the compound to the point that it gained the interest and attention of Acadia. This is the perfect example of a rare disease foundation supporting science and drug development, which would likely not otherwise have happened. IRSF donors allowed us to support the clinical trial early phase, and we are tremendously grateful for that. So we're gonna answer a lot of the questions that we've received about terpenotide today. Um, Kathy, we're happy to have you with us. I do know that you'll be able to answer many questions that have been asked, but I do need to acknowledge that because the FDA is currently reviewing the MDA, that you will not be able to answer every question. We're just grateful to have you here and appreciate you answering what you can. Welcome. Thank you, Melissa. I'm very delighted to be here to speak to the RAT community today. I know that there are a lot of questions about trifenotide and the regulatory process, and I hope that I can provide some helpful information on behalf of Acadia. We very much appreciate IRSF for providing this opportunity. Great. So Dominique and I are both gonna be asking a few questions today. I will kick us off and start with the first question, and it's pretty simple. Can you share with our audience the recent news that you received from the FDA? Yeah, Melissa, I'm happy to. The recent news we received is that the FDA has accepted our application for trifinitide for Rett syndrome, which means that the FDA found that the application contains all of the required documents necessary to move to the review stage. The FDA has also granted a priority review for the new drug application, um, usually called the NDA, which means that from the time of our announcement, they will take six months for their review and that they will be making a decision by March 12th, 2023. That's wonderful, Kathy. One frequent question that we receive is how may trofinitide work in the treatment of Rett syndrome? In the brain, we naturally have a protein called insulin growth factor one or IGF-1 that supports normal health of the neurons that make up our brain. IGF-1 is normally split off at its end so that there is a small fragment of protein called GPE. Trifinitide is similar to this GPE fragment of IGF-1, but it has been modified so that it lasts longer in the body. Trifinitide is an investigational drug, and it was designed to treat the symptoms of Rett syndrome by potentially reducing inflammation in the brain and supporting synaptic function. Um, synapses are the way that cells or neurons in the brain communicate with each other, and this communication is really important for normal functioning. Um, Trifinitide um, is thought to overcome the synaptic and neuronal immaturities that are characteristic of Rett syndrome brains. Trifinitide efficacy and safety in the treatment of Rett syndrome is currently under review and has not been approved by the FDA. Thanks, Kathy. And another common question we have heard is what data are the FDA evaluated in their review? Can you break down some of the data and explain some of the primary endpoints? 
Yes, Dominique, I'm happy to. Our NDA application to the FDA includes results from the pivotal phase three lavender study that examined the efficacy and safety of trofinitide compared to placebo in 187 girls and young women aged between five and 20 years old with Rett syndrome. In this study, approximately half of the participants received trofinitide and the other half placebo meaning it looked and tasted the same, but did not contain trofinitide. In the lavender study, there were two different assessments that were primarily used to examine the efficacy of trofinitide. These are called co-primary endpoints as they both had to be positive for the study be, to be considered successful. The first efficacy endpoint is a measurement called the Rett Syndrome Behavior Questionnaire or RSBQ that is completed by the caregiver, which is usually one of the parents. This scale has 45 questions on which the caregiver rates a range of symptoms that are important in Rett syndrome. Every patient with Rett syndrome has a different set of symptoms. Therefore, the total score of the RSPQ was used to evaluate the efficacy of trofinitide in this study. The second co-primary efficacy endpoint used in the study is called the Clinical Global Impression of Improvement, or CGII. And this is a rating scale performed by the clinician or the RET patient's doctor. The CGII rates whether the RET syndrome overall has worsened or improved compared to the start of the study. In clinical trials, this is an established efficacy scale and has been used widely in clinical trials of many different neurologic conditions, including Rett syndrome. In the Lavender study, both co-primary endpoints were statistically significant when comparing trofinitide to placebo at the end of the study, which is week 12. Additionally, as you know, communication is one of the most important concerns for caregivers in Rett syndrome as a loss of spoken language and decreased ability to communicate non-verbally is one of the common features. Therefore, another key efficacy endpoint for this study was chosen to evaluate the effect of trofinitide on non-verbal communication. This scale is called the CSBS DPIT social scale. In the Lavender Phase three study, trofinitide showed statistically significant separation from placebo in the CSBS DPIT social scale on this key endpoint at week 12. Thanks so much, Kathy. And that, that's a lot to go through. So I appreciate you explaining it um, in understandable forms. So if approved, what symptoms of Rett syndrome will trofinitide treat? So Acadia submitted an NDA to the FDA is for trofinitide for the treatment of Rett syndrome in adults and children two years of age and older. As part of their review and as they look at the data submitted along with um, information submitted on Rett syndrome, the FDA will determine what the indication for trofinitide will be if approved. This decision will be communicated in the prescribing information released by the FDA at the time of approval. As I just noted in the Lavender study, a significant improvement was observed on the co-primary endpoint of the RSBQ total score compared with placebo from baseline to week 12, which is the caregiver assessment that measures a range of symptoms. The 45 questions on the RSBQ can be grouped into eight different subscales that represent different features of Rett syndrome. These include general mood, breathing problems, hand behaviors, repetitive face movements, body rocking and expressionless face, nighttime behaviors, fear and anxiety, and walking and standing. In the Lavender study, all of these subscales were directly in favor of trofinitide, indicating that there weren't just improvements in one set of symptoms. Thanks. And were there any side effects observed in the Lavender study? Yeah, so in the Lavender study, the most common side effects were diarrhea, 
which were experienced in 81% of patients taking trifinitide and 19% of patients in the placebo group, and vomiting, which was experienced by 27% of patients taking trifinitide and 10% of patients in the placebo group. And will you have a recommended diarrhea or GI management plan for patients and their doctors if this is approved? Yes, we will be working with the FDA to include appropriate recommendations for the management of these side effects. And these will appear in the prescribing information for healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, as well as caregivers and parents. Kathy, can you remind our audience how trofinitide was given in clinical trials and will a similar dosing regimen be part of the FDA approval? Yeah, in our clinical trials, trofinitide was given two times a day, and this was generally once in the morning and once in the afternoon or evening. The amount of trofinitide given depends on the weight of the RET patient. So smaller patients get a smaller dose and larger patients get a larger dose. And trofinitide is a solution that can be given either by drinking this liquid, or if the patient has a G-tube, it can also be given through the G-tube. If trofinitide is approved, then information about how the drug is given will be included in the prescribing information that the FDA will release. That's a great overview. Thank you, Kathy. Um, another question that we're receiving is, if trofinitide is approved, is it expected that individuals would take uh, trofinitide for their entire life? Rett syndrome is a lifelong condition, as I'm sure everyone is aware. The length of a particular treatment is a clinical decision that would need to be made between the patient and their caregivers and their doctor based on each patient's medical circumstances. One area in our community that has received a lot of attention lately is males with Rett syndrome. Is there anything you can share about the potential use of trofinitide in males? Yeah, and we get a lot of questions about males with Rett syndrome as well. As part of their review, the FDA will determine what the indication for trofinitide will be. And this will include whether this includes males. And this is, decision will be based on information about the disease and the information that was included in the NDA submission. This information will also be reflected in the prescribing information if trofinitide is approved. For those who are in the REC community but are not living in the United States or outside of the United States, could you share a little bit about Acadia's plan for um, kind of regulatory approvals or any access to trifinitide outside of the U.S.? Yeah, we've been talking a lot about the FDA, which is the regulatory agency in the United States, but every country has their own regulatory agency that a company needs to apply for approval. Once an application is received in a country, that country will do their own independent evaluation of whether they will approve the drug or not and who can receive it. And this is separate from the decision that the US FDA makes. Back in 2018, Acadia entered into an agreement with Neuron Pharmaceuticals for the development and commercialization of trofinitide for Rett syndrome in North America. What this means is that for trifinitide, Acadia is responsible for development and potential approval in North America, and Neuron is still responsible for development and approval in all countries outside of North America, including Europe. Thank you, appreciate that. We're also seeing questions from parents whose children participated in the clinical trial, and um, they're wondering when and if they can start to talk about what their experience has been with trifinitide in the trial, what maybe they've seen uh, through their participation. Thanks, Melissa. This, I think this is a really important question. I understand that parents may want to share, um, but this is a period at which the FDA is carefully um, looking at the NDA. At Acadia, we are really committed to scientific standards that ensure the reliability of our clinical trials. 
We work closely with the FDA to be compliant in everything that we do as we work towards our collective goal of bringing this treatment to rat patients. Because longer term trials with Jofenatide are still ongoing with enrolled patients, at this time it's not appropriate to share information to maintain the integrity of these studies and the communication with the FDA. As we work our way through the FDA review process, if this changes, we, or um, I hope IRSF, will let you know if uh, this policy would change. Kathy, and another question that's come up is that in the recent company announcement, you mentioned that the FDA has also informed Acadia that at this time, they're not planning to hold an advisory committee meeting. What does it mean if the FDA does not convene an advisory committee meeting? Thanks, Dominique. On some occasions, the FDA will hold um, this meeting called an advisory committee meeting to get outside advice from experts in the field as they are reviewing the NDA. This is done sometimes, but not always. If they don't require an advisory committee meeting, which is what they've communicated to us at this point in time, it means at this point, they don't have any questions that require a committee of outside experts. Thank you, Kathy. And finally, um, just the, kind of the last two questions. Um, Assuming that trifinitide is approved, uh, I think the questions are going to be how quickly can families have access to the drug and also importantly, how much is it going to cost? And we'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, if approved by the FDA, which as I mentioned, the date that we expect a decision by is March 12th, 2023. At that point, if approved, Acadia will work very closely with doctors and insurance companies to make Jofenatide available to patients soon after this approval in the United States. As we get closer to this date, um, we will provide more updates. As far as costs go, it's too early at this point to discuss top cost. Typically, the price of a drug is determined just following FDA approval because we need to get information back from the FDA. Acadia will have a patient services team in place to work directly with families, doctors, and insurance companies to help make trifinitide available if it is approved. That's great, thank you. Well, Kathy, on behalf of Dominique and me and our team and the community, I really wanna thank you very much for your time today answering many of the questions that we've been receiving. I, I know that this is a really exciting time for Acadia as well as for our foundation and the community. So thank you for being with us. Um, to those of you who are tuning in, I would ask you to uh, join us at our next Red Ed webinar, which is gonna be on December 6th, uh, where we're gonna uh, present part three of our series, uh, Transitioning to Adulthood. Um, until then, thank you very much. Take care.